Hello, I'm Richard Orford, and you're watching The Real. Today, I'm slap bang in the middle of one of the world's great cities. It's creative, it's dynamic, it's cosmopolitan. It's where East meets West in 21st century Europe. Once a city divided, the walls have since come tumbling down, and today it's been rebuilt. And word on the street has it that this is the next property investment hotspot. And I've come to find out why. Willkommen to Berlin. First up, check out the number of visitors to the city. Last year saw a record-breaking 5 million tourists, so it's no wonder that Berlin's property market is growing too. And who wouldn't want to walk in the footsteps of Marlene Dietrich, Sir Norman Foster and David Hasselhoff? All right, maybe not the Hofmeister, but you get the picture. Berlin always has been and always will be a cutting-edge, vibrant and thriving city. And now, Berlin is a world city that's big enough to compete with London, New York and Barcelona. There are so many exciting things to do here, 365 days of the year. Now, take a look around you in the meantime, green space, loads of it. In fact, 30% of the city centre is covered in it, so it's a cinch to go picnicking, strolling or people watching right in the heart of the city. Mmm. Better. Now, London has the Thames, Dublin has the Liffey, but it was complete news to me that Berlin's got its very own river, the River Spree. And did you know just exactly how many galleries and museums there are in Berlin? In 2006 alone, 11.4 million people visited everything from the Checkpoint Charlie Museum to this, the Erotic Museum. As for the other 174 centres of culture, well, they're not quite so uh, specialist, but you'll never be short of amazing things to do or see. And getting to Berlin for a property hunt is easy. It's less than two hours by air from the UK and Ireland, flying direct from any number of airports. A taxi from one of the three Berlin airports averages 20 euros and the bus, two euros. Now, Berlin is one of the greenest cities in the world. There are trees everywhere, the streets are lined with them. How many? I don't know, but I've got a couple of hours to kill, so let's find out, shall we? One, two, three. 397,462. Three. Th 390. Oh, Frankfurter. Oh, I'm cream crackered. Well, finally found the answer. 400,000 trees in Berlin. How do I know this? Well, after several hundred attempts and several hundred times of losing count, I finally discovered the answer had been on page one of the tour guide all along. But here's a top tip. If you want to see the city like a true Berliner would about some embarrassing tour guide droning on at you on one of those open top buses, then all you've got to do is catch the 100, which pops along every few minutes and takes in all the major sites, including the Brandenburg Gate, the TV Tower and the cathedral as well. And it only costs you two euros and 10 cents. It's an absolute snip. Next stop, Brandenburg Gate. Getting around's easy. There's the underground, U-Bahn, overground, the S-Bahn and tons of buses. Now, if ever a country had an image problem, it's Germany. Let's be honest about this. You can't be the baddie in two world wars and then expect to win any popularity contest. Having said all of that, the end of the Second World War was well over 60 years ago now. And as you can see these days, people are literally queuing up to get a piece of Berlin. Why? Well, let's ask Natasha from the tourist board. So how have tourist attitudes changed towards Berlin over the past few decades? Well, before the 90s, before the wall had fallen in 89, Berlin used to be the city with a wall. But now it's something completely different because Berlin is one of the trendiest cities in Europe now. So what would be your top tips for tourists? One top tip would be to get um, our Berlin welcome card and it's everything included like public transportation and you get all kinds of price reductions on approximately 150 different things you can do in Berlin. So if you come here on a short-term break, what would you say are the, the top places you must go and see? Well, they should by all means go to the city centre, go to the Reichstag. Close to here is the Brandenburg Gate. Then they should walk down the famous street Unter den Linden, see the famous Museum Island, and then I would recommend them to make a beautiful boat trip. 
But it's not just the future of tourism that looks good. Looking around the city, the economy is also booming and the property market has never been more exciting. But it's not always been that way. And when you visit Berlin, there's still one thing niggling in the back of your mind, and that's history. Now, the name Berlin comes from the Slav word Berl, meaning swamp. And that's because the city was built on marshes which were drained in the 12th century by Germanic tribes. And it's said today that if you dig a hole anywhere in the city, it'll fill with water. Nobody, though, could have foreseen that Berlin would be at the heart of European history for the next 800 years. From the Holy Roman Empire to the Reformation, and from Frederick the Great to Kaiser Bill, Berlin's past is as exciting and vibrant as Berlin's present. Then came the Great War of 1914 to 1918, and the rest, as they say, is history. One place that certainly changed with the city is the Olympic Stadium, scene of controversy in 1936, but scene of triumph in 2006. Oh, yes. Oh, baby. Excellent. Hey, what? Oh, sorry. To get the inside track on the stadium, I met up with tour guide Tim Varnholz. Tim, tell us all about this stadium. It's a magnificent building. Yeah, the stadium was built for the Summer Olympics of 1936. It was the largest stadium when it was completed in August 36 with 100,000 spectators. Tell me what happens in this place today. Today, Olympic Stadium is the home stadium of Hertha BSC, Berlin's major football team. We also have an American football team here, the Berlin Thunder. We have uh, concerts, of course, mostly the big names are here who are able to fill the stadium. Like who, who have you had here? Rolling Stones, yeah. just after World Cup. They're older than the stadium, aren't yeah. they? You can see the stadium individually by turning up on non-event days, but guided tours are definitely the gold medal option, as you get to see behind the scenes, including the warm-up hall, changing rooms and VIP areas. Cool. Tell you what, Tim, a few famous faces have sat up here in their time. Yeah, for example, during the World Cup last, last summer, and the first seat we had the Chancellor, German Chancellor, and uh, you are seated where Sepp Blatter, president of the FIFA, was, and I'm sitting, I think, on the place of Franz Beckenbauer, and a very different Chancellor used the balcony over there. Who was that then? This was Hitler's balcony, and this is where Hitler uh, hold his speeches during the party rallies which were held here at the Olympic Stadium and of course where he declared open the Olympic Games in 1936. And uh, the Olympic Stadium was used for the World Cup last summer and I think this shows both the history and the modern Germany. It was touch and go whether the stadium would get bulldozed after the war but now this epic building is more or less the only surviving example of Third Reich architecture. But what's interesting is, in modern-day Berlin, that there's little reminder to the naked eye that it happened. Gone is Hitler's bunker, and gone, pretty much, is the Berlin Wall. All you've got left now is little slabs of graffiti like this that the tourists take photos of. Right here, where I'm standing 20 years ago, was no man's land. These days, it's every man's land. You've got tourists, you've got money pouring in, and amazing modern-day buildings like that. In short, Berlin has moved on. There are even moves to strip Austrian-born Hitler of his German citizenship. A a real kick in the gerbils. Now, if there's one thing in Berlin that everyone's proud of, it's the Brandenburg Gate. Many famous speeches have taken place here. For example, in 1987, Ronald Reagan stood on this very spot and went, Oi, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And in 1963, John F. Kennedy stood here and announced to the world, Ich bin ein Berliner, which was somewhat unfortunate because a Berliner is also one of these. So to many people, what he was saying was, I am a donut. Oh! Mmm, donuts. And while we're on the subject, the city's also home to the oldest chocolate house in the world, Fassbender and Rausch, where I met Stefan. Well, Stefan, looking around Berlin, I noticed there's lots of chocolate, lots of cafes and lots of restaurants. But yeah. what you've done here is combine all three together in one place. That's right, and this was not quite so easy because um, we are based here on chocolate. All the things what we're doing has something to do with chocolate. So if you come to visit here, what can you see? When you come in the shop, mm. it's not like shopping, it's like you're coming on a, on a, a temple, you're coming here. Yeah, <laughs> you, you don't have to sell it to me. I was like slavering the moment I walked in. Those models as well that you've got are amazing. We have a chocolate here and we build all these this, this models and also upstairs here in the restaurant, um, our idea is find 
fine dining together with chocolate. And you've got a selection here to show us, starting off with the soup here. This is a celery soup. Yeah. It's um, made in the, in the celery roots with chocolate, with dark chocolate. I'm using just fine flavoured chocolate. Celery soup with yeah. chocolate. Yeah. Oh, that is lovely. That is really, that's like having your starter and your dessert all at once. It's a my favourite. A real taste <laughs> yeah. sensation, that's your favourite, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Okay, what about this one here? This is fish with um, lemongrass sauce with white chocolate. Is that caviar it's... there? Exactly. And chocolate blobs? Yeah. Different. I prefer the soup, I have to say. What about this one here? Is, and this, here, is this lamb? Yeah, you, you got lamb, lamb and chocolate now. With dark. You crazy fool. All right, let's give this a go. And... Oh. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. <laughs> Love that. I'm going to buy that one. Thank you very much. I would have a dessert, but I think it might be a bit too savoury for me, so I'm going to stick with the soup and the main <laughs> course. Thank you very much. If you want to head off now, um, I've got this covered. Thanks. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Now, if you're coming to Berlin, don't leave home without these facts. First of all, leave out the Basel Fawlty impressions. Even as a joke, the Nazi symbols like the swastika and the salute and the funny walk, just don't cut it around here. It's going to land you in hot water, and by hot water, I mean the nick. Moving on, if you're a bit strapped for cash or you're generally a bit of a tight wad, then Thursday afternoons are for you because all the state-owned galleries and museums are completely free of charge. ka -ching. Most shops and restaurants don't take credit cards, bizarrely enough, so if you're planning to go to a restaurant for dinner and you're hoping that your flexible friend will pay for it, then phone ahead to the restaurant first and check. You'll find that most restaurants have English-speaking staff. And finally, it's known as Boozy Berlin. It's a late night city, so don't go to dinner before eight o'clock and just be aware that there is no closing time, so you really can go for it. I wonder if the budget will stretch to an all dayer. Oh, thanks a lot, Mr. Producer. Yeah, that's great, thank you. I'll take that as a no then. It's me, brilliant disguise, eh? Join me after the break when I'll be pulling back the old iron curtain and sneaking into East Berlin. Nothing's gonna stop me now. Except for perhaps that big burly American security guard with the really, really big flag. Impressive though, isn't it? Morning, sir. So, join me. 10 hundred hours, Cafe Mozart. I'll be wearing a red carnation, you'll be wearing a pretty dress. Mom's the word, see you on the other side of the break. And remember, the eagle has landed. Shh. Welcome back to the real Berlin. Now, less than 20 years ago, what I'm about to do now would have meant I would have certainly spent a long time behind bars, or even worse, had a bullet in my back. For yes, I'm about to cross the border between East Berlin to West Berlin at the famous, or should that be infamous, Checkpoint Charlie. Wish me luck. Checkpoint Charlie became the symbol of the Cold War, separating the communist East from the West. But I don't need papers or diplomatic immunity because these days that's all history. And if your memories of East Berlin are still rooted in Frederick Forsyth novels or black and white movies from the Cold War era, then get with the program because these days it's all available in full glorious Technicolor. You can find out all about the checkpoint at the Checkpoint Charlie Museum, where I met with museum director Alexandra Hildebrandt. Alexandra, why did the wall first go up? You know, the GGR government and also the Soviets, they was angry with the people who did want to go out the GGR. And so it, the wall went straight up and it went up overnight, didn't it? What happened? Over the night, the, the families were separated. The grandmother from grandson, the children from parents, because it was weekend. It was a Sunday. So families were split up because the wall went up and wherever they were at the time, they had to stay there for the rest of their lives. Yes. It's amazing. The museum covers the history of the checkpoint as well as modern-day non-violent world struggles. 
dotted all around the museum are various forms of transport that people use to get across the border. And it's a real testament to the spirit, resolve and ingenuity of mankind. For example, what we have here is a homemade hot air balloon. It was at the time the biggest ever built in Europe and it got eight people, two families across the border during the 70s. No, nope, it's not Debbie McGee. One woman in 1969 spent 45 minutes in this converted petrol tank. Now that's tragic. One woman even managed to escape sandwiched between two surfboards on top of a Renault. That was in 1987. I think you can get out now. For every tale of triumph, there's one of tragedy, and the museum is a fitting memorial to generations of brave men and women. Modern Germany is renowned for its motor cars. BMW, Audi, Mercedes, Volkswagen, illustrious names that roll off the tongue like a pouting, purring Porsche. So I feel ever so slightly stitched up that today I'm going to be riding in one of these. Not exactly Vorsprung der Technik, is it? It's actually the iconic East German car, the Trabant. Although, being a bit of a showbiz lovey, I did manage to wangle the stretch version. Get me. The Trabant is a shining example of the nostalgia the city has for all things East. It's summed up by a brilliant Germanic play on words, Ostalgia. Ost for East and, well, you can figure out the rest for yourselves. You can do a tour of the atmospheric East in a Trabant for 25 euros. My guide was Marcus Muller-Tenkoff. Groovy name, groovy guy. So, Marcus, the Trabant, 50 years old, 0 to 20 in what feels like about five hours, about as much spring on it as a 15 stone rabbit. Uh, what is the appeal of going around Berlin and seeing it in one of these? You drive the car by yourself. Yeah. You get live commentary on Berlin, and it's a very unique way to explore Berlin. Uh, the history of the car is related to East Germany, of course. Um, about 100,000 cars were produced every year. People waited about 10 to 15 years long to get hold of a car. That's a big waiting list, isn't and, it? And you were able to get it second hand, but then you had to pay more. So, Marcus, what was life really like in the East and the West? How much did it differ in Berlin? Very much. East Berlin was very state-owned, state-planned, but they felt very relaxed, very secure, very safe. West Berlin was like New York in the 80s as well, so very much freedom orientated. That's a fantastic building, isn't it? We are now looking at what we name the French Dome. And what about this one here, right in the center? Well, this is what we name the Concert House, and this is the seat of the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. This is where Leonard Bernstein gave a concert really? when the reunification took place on the 3rd of October 1990. We are now in between East and West Berlin. So this side here yeah. is the so-called uh, West. Okay. And that side is the so-called former East. So and right now we're in West. kind of no man's land, are we? Exactly. In the olden days. There was one wall here and one wall there. So 20 years ago, the idea of driving right down here would have been unthinkable, wouldn't it? Yeah. If you were not an official uh, traveler, you were in the danger of getting shot by the soldiers. So with the wall gone, how do you know if you're east or west? Easy, just wait for the lights. Marcus, ample man, sounds like a superhero. What is he and, and what's all this about? It's the pedestrian traffic light man from the East Germany. And after the reunification of West and East Germany, they want to put away all the signs, all the things from East Germany and want to change him for the West German things. This Ampel man um, is more, has more character, is more popular than the boring West German man. This was an old West German man, then they made a new German man, but it's very boring. And um, this so is our fella here and his, uh, yes, yes. And his mate as well. Much more character. Is that his hand there? Because it looks to me like the green man's flashing, if you catch my drift. What exactly is that there? That's your interesting. That's your arm. <laughs> Are you, you sure? But you can think, all, think <laughs> also other things. He's back on all the traffic lights again now, and mm -hmm. everyone wants a piece of him. They want to buy merchandise with him on. Yes, now he's very famous he's, uh, because they like this man and they like also the story. That is, this is the only sign of the East Germany that remained. He's certainly living on strong in your shop because we've got lights here. Uh, we've also got a flip-flop for the beach. And uh, what is this? That's a new thing. It's a pasta. And we start <laughs> to opening also Ampelmann restaurant and so we need the pasta and the pizza. 
so you can get just about anything you want as long as you like it in red or green. Do you know what? I think I better be careful where I go in Berlin today. I might cause a few accidents. Whether it's red lights, green lights or disco lights, Berlin is famous for its nightlife. After dark, the city is nothing short of legendary. Techno or punk, gay or straight, quiet or raucous, surely you'll find one of the five and a half thousand plus clubs, bars, pubs or restaurants to your taste. Five and a half thousand. That's one heck of a pub crawl, isn't it? How long have we got? Five minutes. Five minutes? Better get a move on then. If you're on a Berlin house hunt or business trip, it's good to know where the posh nosh is. Well, I'm here at Fischer's Fritz at the Regent Berlin, one of the top restaurants in the entire city. And I'm here to meet the head chef, who's going to be telling me all about German cuisine. What I didn't know, though, was he was about to make me the new boy in the kitchen. So, Christian, we've got fish and chips and steak and kidney pie in the UK. What have the Germans got? Well, we have bratwurst and sauerkraut, as you know. <laughs> it's high culture. But in all seriousness, there must be some traditional German fare. Well, um, we have um, some kind of braised beef, braised pork. We have, of course, sauerkraut, nice sauerkraut dishes. We have a lot of uh, soups. Now, you're a head chef in a top restaurant. Presumably, you do international cuisine here. Yes, we go for international cuisine, specialised on seafood mainly, based on the French cuisine. And what I want you to do today is a turbot. Here we have a nice piece of turbot. So you want me to prepare this, OK? Yes, please. So you <laughs> take off the, the head of the fish. We'll look at an artist at work. And then you cut a piece like this. OK. So I give you this instrument now. This instrument, OK. There we go. I don't know what we're going to do this. Put some olive oil in the pen. OK. And it goes. And here we go. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah, How long is this going to cook for? Well, up to seven minutes. Now, is this, uh, is this doing all right, is it? This is wonderful. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to do that because it just looks good. There we go. That should help. I think we have to pull a little bit of the oven, if you don't mind. And now, my dear friend. Yes? You're going to dress in this way the plate. You want me to create that? Yes, sir. I wish you good luck. Waiting for you in the restaurant. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. You just take it easy bye then, bye. Chris. Can I have that back? Just a... All right, he's gone. OK, um, I guess then we'll need to use a bit of this. Excuse fingers. <laughs> Blimey, I've made a complete pig's ear of it already. It's a bit like the Generation game, this, isn't it? Good game, good game, all right, my lads. A little bit of sauce on the top here. Just do a little bit of that. It's a masterpiece. There goes the towel. Bob's your uncle. I'm laughing. <clears throat> uh, there we go, sir. I think you'll find this very much to your liking. <clears throat> so I'm going to taste it now. Jolly good. We'll see. Does sir like? Hmm. Problem? Take the white jacket out, please. You're not happy? Take the white jacket out. You have to wear this black jacket now because you are now the head chef. Oh! <laughs> I'm not worthy. You're I'm not, not worthy. Of course you're not <laughs> worthy. I knew you'd come around to my way of thinking. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to be earning in my new role as head chef, but what I can tell you is a few other average salaries here in Germany. Now, a checkout worker could expect to earn about 12,000 euros a year, a waiter, 15,000, a teacher, 32,400, a junior doctor would get about 40,000 euros a year, and a newly qualified lawyer would start on 30,000 euros a year, although this could double depending on the size of the firm. Cliché or not, there really is something for everyone in Berlin. Bars and pubs are slightly spread out, so you'll need a plan of attack. One of the hottest tickets in town is the arty and bohemian Prenzlauerberg district, and a great place to enjoy the no-limit opening hours. But if you really want your night to end on a high, take yourself off to Mitter. Right now, I'm on the 16th floor of an old tower block right in the heart of the city. Now, in the early 60s, this was the premises of the CIA, who used to run covert operations here because it had such fantastic panoramic views of the whole of Berlin, including Checkpoint Charlie. Well, after the CIA left, it became a bar, a club and a restaurant. These days, it's all three. It's a sophisticated little haunt called Solar, and at 60 metres above the ground, it really is experiencing the high life. The city's social life is helping to attract young and affluent professionals to Berlin. Having struggled a bit financially after the 1990 reunification, Berlin is booming. 
But if all that seems a little bit la di da, you can always come to a place like this. Paulana's, a good old fashioned German restaurant and beer hall where drinks are for men. And I've lined up the specialities here. Feast your eyes on this. This is a Berliner Weisser Grown. It's a beer with green stuff in it and a straw. And it tastes like a soft drink. No thanks. Over here we've got a Berliner Weisser Rot, which again is a beer. This time it tastes slightly more like beer, but it's got red stuff in it and a bit of froth and again a straw. No thanks. But don't worry, I've got it covered because I've also ordered one of these babies. Oh yes, a good old traditional style of German ale. Have it. Yes, it was the mysterious Joel Grey, master of ceremonies in the film Cabaret, who said, Inside it is so hot that every night we face a battle to keep the girls from losing all of their clothing. So don't go away. Who knows? Tonight we may lose the battle. I can honestly say I hope my wife is not watching this. Come on to the Cabaret, my friend. Actually, that's the last curtain call for part two. See you after this break. Willkommen back to the real Berlin. Now, sharp, sexy, and the top nighttime attraction for all. But enough about me, let's get back to Berlin. And this great city has always been at the forefront of style, architecture, and design. Great news for forward-thinking investors. Who wouldn't want to get into the property market of the 2006 city of design? To find out more, I visited Berlin's Bauhaus Museum. The Bauhaus movement started in 1919, uh, immediately after the First World War, and its founder, Walter Gropius, wanted to bring some kind of design education to art schools, something that didn't exist at that time. It's getting easier to see why so many people are coming to Berlin needing to rent apartments. If you're young, gifted and German, it's where you have to be. Only in the 50s, design in Germany restarted, and then, German, so to speak, West Germany had to catch up. Bauhaus has by then also become some kind of style label, but the Bauhaus itself was, in the 20s at least, a much wider thing. I think German design still holds world class, and I think uh, we still can make first class design here. Now, design isn't something that's lost on the city's architects either. In Berlin, the apartment block is king, and many of the old communist star blocks are currently receiving a well-deserved nip and tuck. Plus, you're getting the old ultra-modern new building like that springing up. That's the home of top architect Christopher Burns, and today he's going to be showing me around his pad. I'm kind of thinking it might be quite nice. Just a hunch. Chris. Hey, Richard. Nice to meet you. Come on in. Thanks very much for the invite. And can I just say, what an amazing apartment. Can you just talk me through this? This is the living room, it's the bathroom, it's the kitchen. It's, the <laughs> it's, sitting everything. Room. it's just about everything. It's a one-room apartment. I'm drawn towards the concrete wall, which you don't see very often, but it really works, doesn't it? Sure. The raw concrete is uh, something that we were interested in mixing materials between fine materials, like the wood or like the floor here, and kind of raw materials, tough materials, like the raw concrete. What was your overall concept for this apartment? I think that the most important thing in this apartment and in this entire house is the idea of transformation. In this 60 square meters, you should be able to do just about everything. So you're always trying to use the entire space. That's one theme. The other theme is then the theme of transformation, so that each piece of furniture or each thing that you have in here does more than one thing. That includes the facade here. And this is kind of combining the two, isn't it? Because you've got all the daylight coming in and the, and the, and the light, if you like, and then obviously Exactly. You're transforming it by turning it pretty much into a balcony. Do you think there's a real buzz at the moment in Berlin when it comes to architecture and property? And Definitely. There's a lot going on, actually. Um, there's a lot in the architectural world. There are more architects in Berlin than I think any other German city, and Germany has more architects than any other country in Europe. There's, there's a lot happening. What other features do you have in this apartment, then, Chris? The bathroom is part of the entire room. You can slide open this giant wall and integrate the bathroom into the rest of the apartment. 
Then you've got the bedroom side on the back, and it creates a zone so that space is flowing through. As an architect, what do you love about the city itself? Berlin is interesting because it's a mix of really different parts of the city. It has really ugly portions, it has also really beautiful portions. And you can open the door into a restaurant or into a shop and suddenly you're transported into a different place, into a different country, into a different time. And that's actually what we wanted to do here as well. We wanted to open the door and suddenly you're somewhere else. Now, Berlin and history, I get that. Berlin and design goes without saying. But Berlin and shopping, you what? You bet. And if you're gonna go shopping, you wanna go to the daddy of all department stores. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome to the Cadave. <laughs> Gabby, what's the shopping like in Berlin at the moment? It's a tremendous experience. We have se several shopping areas. One is uh, around the KDV. That's uh, one of the main department stores in Europe. And then we have other ones like the Hackersche Mark, for instance, around that area. We have areas like Covent Garden. And then we have small areas with small shops, which are located in other districts like Prenzlauer Berg. Now, I've heard it's the biggest department store in Europe. Is that true? Yes, it is. Together with Harrods, we have a merchandising area of 60,000 square meters of sales floor area. Is there a particular area of the building that you're proud of? Yes, there is certainly. The sixth floor, the food department. OK, should we take a look at it? Of course, let's go. It really doesn't matter what you're looking for. Cadave has everything you could ever need for you and your brand new Berlin apartment. Now it's tough work shopping for luxury goods, but don't worry, you can always refuel. Yeah, this is the famous food hall, the largest one in Europe. 7,000 square meters of sales floor area. And you can buy anything here, from cakes to wine. We also sell about 1,300 different kinds of cheese. And we have caviar and salmon and lobster. But you can have a normal beer here as well. How many people come in here every day? About 50,000 every day. 50,000? Yeah. The average customer spends about one and a half hours here on the sixth floor, just looking around, eating something, enjoying themselves. With 34 cooking stations and over 1,000 seats, the Cadave Food Hall caters for the whole of Berlin. But caviar's never on my shopping list. How much will life's basics cost me? It's time to get trolled. Ah, freshly baked baguette. Gonna need that. And I know which side my baguette needs buttering on. There we go, pop that in. Just one of these 1,300 cheeses, that's nice. Now, where's it hiding? Come on, where are you, little tinker? There it is. Bag of sugar, chuck that in. Marvellous. Right, uh, a litre of semi-skimmed milk next. Yep, lovely. Right, alcohol, alcohol, mmm, alcohol. Nothing too expensive, though. There we go, lovely. Right, free-range eggs, that's what I want. Now, oh, blimey. Oh, no, what a nightmare. I hope no one sees that. Just put it back. No one will notice, lovely. Uh, and finally, let's get some loo roll. Mm. Excellent, that'll do. Right, what's the damage? Well, I'll tell you what, the total comes to 11 euros and 93. So roughly, we're talking about seven quid there. Now, back in London, the equivalent would cost you 12 pounds and 74 pence. So by my reckoning, you're saving around about a fiver. Thank you very much, danke schön. Well, the price is right, but what about the lifestyle? I decided to see the sights by river and chat with a real authority on expat Berlin life, entrepreneur Morris Frank. Morris, how long have you lived in Berlin? I've lived here about eight years. I came over here to visit, and I found it to be a really exciting, extraordinary city at the time, back in the late 90s. And there's still this atmosphere of renewal and change that you found here after the Berlin Wall came down. Let's talk uh, about your magazine, because you're the publisher of this, the ex-Berliner. Yeah, uh, when I moved here, I realized uh, there was a mar definite market for some kind of English magazine. Um, and so we, five years ago, we launched the ex-Berliner, which is a monthly magazine um, covering topics like culture, nightlife, helping people find their way here. What would you say, then, are the main differences between living in London and living in Berlin? Well, I think um, Berlin is a much more relaxed city in some ways. And I think here you can really have a very nice lifestyle on quite a low budget. Um, and I've noticed in the last five years or so there are just more and more people moving here um, from all over Europe for whatever reasons, um, even from as far away as South America or Japan. What's the property market like at the moment? 
Yeah, I think um, Berlin's actually going through a boom phase. I mean, there's a lot of international people buying here at the moment um, from all over Europe, America. And uh, what you find is that Germans haven't traditionally bought their own homes. And so there's a lot of, there's just a lot of properties available. Well, that all sounds great, doesn't it? And frankly, I'm sold. So I think now's the time to find out exactly what I can get for my property pounds. I've booked a viewing of a typical Berlin buy-to-let with consultant Davina Roselli. This is really, really nice. I mean, people might, I suppose, be off-put by the fact it's part of a block, but once you get inside, it's pretty smart, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much so. Um, as far as city living, I mean, most of the places in Berlin, they are blocks. Yeah. Um, however, when you come into the property, you start to see basically what uh, what they have to, to offer internally. OK, let's have a look in the living room then. I mean, is this typical of the sort of places you're selling at the moment? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, as far as the, the refurbishments, you'll find that they all have the wooden floor uh, with the exception of the kitchen and the bathroom which are fully tiled. Mm. Um, as far as the furnishings, we've really just put these in here to show people the, the space um, that the tenants would be living in. Excellent. And to have your hair done. Well. <laughs> Quite nice. Should we go and have a look in the kitchen? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and again, this is done out really, really smartly, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much so. Good enough for you to cook me dinner. I wouldn't say it's that nice. <laughs> Uh, now, tell me a little bit about this area, then. OK, um, we're in the area of Schoenenberg, five minutes from city centre. As far as the transport links, you have a choice of the overland train, the underground, um, the bus routes, obviously, and the ring road, which are all two minutes from the front door. OK, so I guess all of that makes this a pretty popular area, then, does it? It's very much so, a bit an up-and-coming area, yeah. OK, can we see the rest of the flat? You certainly can. All right, after you. <coughs> And to your left here, we've got the second bedroom. Mm -hmm. And then the smallest room in the house, the bathroom. OK. Which leading on to our master bedroom with a small veranda that looks down onto the internal courtyard. Very nice. OK, Davina, big question. How much? OK, for a property of this size, you'd be looking in the region of €100,000. £70,000. Is that correct. good value for money? Well, what do you think? I think it is, isn't it? I think you get a lot less for that in London, for example. Absolutely. Thanks for showing me around. One Londoner who swapped Ealing for Prenzlauberg is Galena Green. She opened a cafe that's now every expat's home from home. So, Galena, what made you decide to stay here? Well, when I came over, it was 1991, and it was a very exciting time in Berlin. Everything was open. There were illegal clubs and bars. Everything was open all night long. Uh, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> So is there a big expat community here? Yes, there is. I think there was even more so just after the war came down. A lot of Australians, Americans and British. It's settled down a bit now, but there's certainly a total cross-section of international people living here. So how would you describe this place? Um, well, it's a kind of mix. It's an ice cream cafe for the kids and mothers. It's a place for um, office workers to come for lunch. It's a place for people to hang out in the sun. The expats come, of course, because we have a few English things. And what kind of things do you have on the menu here, then? Um, we have a real cross-section, for example, we have Brazilian juices, we have um, classic English things like Cornish pasties or British tea and biscuits. Um, we also have um, locally produced ice cream, organic ice cream. So I think it's a reflection of what Berlin is like at the moment, really. Is it quite a young city? I think you just need to take a look around. I mean, just go over to the playground, it's packed with kids. Every mother is pregnant or just has a toddler <laughs> I know, on I haven't been here long, but I've worked, <laughs> I've worked my magic already. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I think it is. It's a very young town, yeah. So having lived in Britain for a while and now having lived in Berlin for 16 years, what are the major differences you're finding between the two? Well, the process of gentrification is certainly taking place here. It's unavoidable. And the prices are going up steadily, but it's still very exciting. You've still got lots of new cafes and restaurants opening up, and there's still plenty of space for new ideas. So, Galena, what do you love most about Berlin? I think it's the sense of community, because um, most of the people who live here tend to live here for a long time, so it's like a little village. Oh, I tell you what, it's going to take me a little while to polish this little lot off. So join me after the break when I'll be getting the real nitty-gritty on Berlin's property market. And you may have already worked out that it's good news for investors, so don't go away.
Welcome back to The Real Berlin. Now, with reunification on the 3rd of October 1990, Berlin instantly became the third largest capital in Europe and the centre of much political wheeling and dealing. In fact, the government invested upwards of 75 billion euros into the country, instantly kick-starting the property market, where prices can be as much as 90, count them, 90% cheaper than back home. 90%, is that true? Right, get me a wallet out, I think. We have a whip round. Honestly, it's like getting blood out of a stone with that crew. I think I'd be better off doing a bit more digging into the Berlin property market. So I'm meeting up with notary Herr Rainer Klingenfuss, and you can't argue with a name like that. Well, first things first, Rainer, what a great view from the top of your building. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're looking here at the new part of of Berlin. These buildings are all built in the last 10, 12 years. The Potsdamer Platz, there was really nothing 12 years ago. Now, I'm hearing that Berlin's a great place to invest, but why do you think now? OK, we had a very, very poor situation the last 10 years. It was, there were really five to 10 hard real estate years. So the so market uh, broke down and nobody bought, uh, uh, bought real estate. And now it's starting again. So why is there so much property available at the moment? Yeah, there are two reasons. One is that uh, there was a lot of development in the beginning of the 90s and the middle of the 90s. The other reason is that uh, government started to sold their state-owned flats. What kind of people are buying then? Yeah, there are two different groups. One group are the big investors. Foreign consumers are, are buying apartments as well. Uh, English consumers, Irish consumers, Danish consumers. Individual loan private investors? Yes, private investors. So this market you would say is newly discovered? Yes, it's not a new market, but newly discovered market. Five years ago, nobody, nobody bought real estate and now it's, new, it's a new market and it's, there are interesting offers on the market. So all in all, would you say that this is a good time to buy? Yes, I'm quite sure. It's, it's the best time we had in the last 10 years. <laughs> Property is such a hot topic in Berlin, I was invited to meet the leader of the FDP, one of Germany's main political parties. Now offered best behaviour for Dr. Martin Lindner. Dr. Lindner, why is it good to invest in Berlin at the moment? Because I think that the prices are still on a very low level. And it's a good time to get your money now in here to Berlin, because compared to other German cities, um, the prices uh, are still low, but they rise. How far has the city come in the last few years? The city itself is, I think, in a pretty good shape because uh, we had a lot of investments in the buildings here in, in Berlin, in arts, in galleries and others. Um, looking across the city, there seems to be quite a lot of new buildings springing up, quite a lot of modern buildings. How do you see the property market developing over the next few years? It's uh, good uh, for investing now. I mean, if you go to, to Grunewald, Zehendorf, Dahlem, very, very interesting and high-level places to be, very good and interesting exclusive houses to, to, to buy. The prices are still low. And it's a, a city of future. We have uh, very interesting points here for tourists, but I think it's also for investing as money. So that's the view from the top. Business is booming. But what's happening at the coalface? Investment specialist David Greenslade will know. So financially, Dave, why is Berlin such a hotspot at the moment? Well, Berlin has been in recession for a long, long time, as we all know. And this has affected the property prices here. Now the government has applied, or the city has applied to the government for loans. This has been difficult to realise, so they have a lot of assets in property, state-owned, which they are now releasing to the market. Mm -hmm. Tenants have the first op opportunity to buy these, and a lot of them are taking up that option. Some aren't, which means you are able to get in at the first prices these properties are being put onto the market. OK, so we're not looking at holiday homes here, we're looking at pure investment. It certainly is. This is not a lifestyle purchase. No emotion should be involved in this. You need to be looking at, if I put X amount of money down, what will my return be in 10 years? The capital gains is what this is all about. OK, let's talk money then. Well, Richard, you're going to be starting prices of €90,000. We'll be getting you in yeah, on a nice property in a very good area, which is going to be desirable for a first-time buyer. And when you're looking to sell, maybe in years to come, will still be in a desirable area in the west of Berlin. If you break that down, in Munich, you're paying €7,000 per square metre. In Berlin, Anything from 1,500 to 1,600 euros is a starting price per square metre. 
In my opinion, these prices will only go up. What's the rental market like at the moment? It's very strong. 1.8 million properties residential in Berlin, of which 1.6 million are rented. That will change slowly, slowly, slowly. The mindset over a 10 year period will change to buy. So for long term investment, this is the city to be in. So if this is purely an investment, you're not going to see this property day to day. So presumably you're going to need good management. The management companies are very good. They will take care of your property fully. It's a full management scheme they offer. External work, internal work. They arrange for all the uh, rental payments to be paid into your account that you will hold here. All you need to worry about is the price of your property going up. What's the tax scenario then? But on a personal level, up to 8,000 euros per annum you can earn on your property. But this will be offset against mortgage payments and rental returns. For the next 10 years, you will not have any taxes to pay. Regarding capital gains, 25% is the current law. But after the 10-year period, there are no capital gains. And of course, we're telling people you need to look at this as a 10-year investment. You will not be affected by it as long as you stay with your investment for the course. OK, Dave, you convinced me. I'm going to buy a property. I'm going to sit on it for 10 years. I'm going to make lots of money. Then what? Three options for you, Richard. Sell the property mm -hmm. and take all the money you've made out of it. Two, renegotiate with a tenant so you've still got your property in Berlin, still working for you, and a tenant. Or three, take the property, release the equity, and reinvest in other properties in Germany or other, other areas of the world. All fairly straightforward? Very straightforward, yes. The sell-off of Berlin's properties has been compared to the British council house boom of the 1980s. And so, if we've wet your whistle, here's our guide to the Berlin districts on their way up. Now, Mitte is literally the middle. It's where you'll find most of the tourist attractions. So property here is very desirable. Schonenberg is an up-and-coming area in the west of Berlin. It's a bit arty, it's a bit bohemian. And that apartment building there is the kind of place that's up for grabs. So really, it's the districts in West Berlin that are in demand at the moment. These include Wilmersdorf, Smart, Residential, and another promising option for investors. Charlottenburg, on the other hand, is one of the more exclusive areas of the city, but interestingly enough, is also one of those areas that's predicted to have big price rises over the next few years. The Old East has plenty of property for sale, though demand is lower than in the West. Look out for areas like Prenzlauerberg, Kreuzberg and Friedrichshain. So, it's obvious, there's a ton of potential here for property prospectors. But Berlin's a new territory for British and Irish investors. So what does the buying process involve? Lawyer Uwe Fischer talks shop over brunch. Well, this is a nice pub, Uwe. Well, it's the, the oldest one I have in Berlin. Is it? Since uh, 1621. Well, I have a good understanding that Napoleon's been here, Jacques Chirac and Charlie Chaplin. And now us. Yeah, the biggest star of all. <laughs> there you go. Um, let's talk business now, and let's talk about the process involved in buying somewhere here in Berlin. Well, it's a very, very straightforward process. Um, both parties go to the notary, he reads out the contract aloud, and uh, both parties sign it, that's it, you pay in the money and then the notary and the land registry make sure that you're entered into the land registry as owner of the flat and once you're in there, you're the owner, we do not have title searches, so it's a very, very straightforward process compared to most other countries. Presumably you have to have a survey done? Uh, we don't usually, no, not, really? not if you buy a single flat, um, wouldn't usually be done. Usually the, the, the manager of the property uh, is responsible to keep up the building anyway and um, the cost of a survey doesn't really relate to the price of a single flat. So uh, but most, most flat buyers don't. And uh, the German bureaucracy, is that worse than the UK's bureaucracy? I, I always assume so because it's horrendous. Lots of paper, and, uh, but we, we file all those, the notary does it. And um, so there's nothing for the buyer really to worry about there. Now obviously you've got a fantastic grasp of English, but uh, is language <laughs> a, a bit of a barrier for people coming over here to try and buy? Not, not really. Many, many Germans do speak English and uh, you can get a translator anywhere. Um, but of course for contracts it's necessary to, to read the translation. It, it's, it doesn't do to simply look at the German translation or listen to it. <laughs> You'll need an, uh, an English language translation and read through that carefully. And once you've bought the property, what's in place as a safeguard in case your investment's not up to score? Oh, here comes a brunch, by the way. Bit of a tradition around these parts, isn't it? There you go. Yeah. I think it's yours, actually. Really? I was going to go for the meat. <laughs> oh, all right, then. Thank um, you. Yeah, what sort of safeguards are in place? The major safeguard you have is that really that by, by having your name in the land registry, you become legal party to the tenancy agreement, so the tenant has to pay his rent to you. Uh, tenants have a lot of rights, um, but uh, on the other hand, 
I was very, very amazed to, to find that squatters have rights in the UK, they have no rights in Germany. <laughs> oh really? That's yeah, quite interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the, the most important question is though, what's for lunch? Well, I don't know what you've got, but mm. um, this is prawn salad. Bulletta, nice. traditional Berlin meatball and um, fried potatoes. Okay, well let's not mess about anymore, get stuck in. Cheers. Right. Cheers. So that's what all the movers and shakers of the Berlin property market think. But I haven't been idle myself. Oh no, picked up one or two facts for myself. And listen up, because they're really useful. Now, going around Berlin, don't expect to see any for sale signs outside properties. To find out what's available, go into your nearest estate agent. Over the last decade, whilst London house prices have gone up by 80%, German house prices have gone through the basement. However, the general consensus now is that all that's about to change. The government here says one of their official objectives over the next 10 years is to get ownership of property in Berlin up from 15% to 50%, and they're now introducing all sorts of policies to make this happen. And finally, you should always factor in things like legal fees and taxes into your budget. In Berlin, set aside around about 10% of the purchase price to cover these costs. There you go then, those are my tips. Good, weren't they? But never mind that, what does everyone else think of this fantastic city? We are very optimistic that the future for Berlin as a tourist destination is great. The future of Berlin will be very interesting and good. It's a city with a very high potential. You feel the change on the street. As you walk up and down the streets, you see the new shops coming, you see uh, the new people coming, you hear the new languages on the street being spoken. I think it's going to be the shopping center of Eastern Europe, so there'll be an influx of many, many East Europeans, uh, which will give some speed to the property market, I hope. It's pretty cheap to live. Um, it's pretty cheap to buy something. Personally, I think that um, you know there's a lot of growth there and that it's going to get itself on the map alongside Edinburgh, London and Dublin. At the moment, the prices are low and uh, we have a real buyer's market. In my opinion, Berlin is the safest property investment you could make at the moment. Berlin has always been a city of change. It's changed history, it's changed attitudes, it's changed appearance. But today, it's Berlin's property market that's been given a new look, which is what gives this place such enormous investment potential. For myself, I found the Berliners really welcoming and I thoroughly enjoyed my stay here. Now, if you'd like more information on the programme, then in the UK, call 0800 310 1444. And in Ireland, call 1800 6350 31. Alternatively, visit our website, overseasproperty.tv.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.